Congratulations, true crime addicts. We've survived another week. It is Friday, February 3rd, 2023. And this week we have an update in the Alex Murdaugh trial, two tales of doppelgangers gone bad, and uh, new clues in the Holly Perriannon case out of Massachusetts. Stay tuned. Yes, super excited. We are all pumped to have James Author Renner. James Renner. Suspects that James Renner has zeroed in. James Renner's once again drops a bombshell. Investigative journalist Renner. reporter Renner. James Renner, who's been James on the podcast Renner. a long time. Friend local of mine. writer James Renner. And we're back. And as always, we have Walter manning the camera. Say hello to everybody, Walter. All right, let's let's get to it. Um, you know, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for following every week. I, I love the numbers I'm seeing. We're 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 up in the rankings, in uh, you know, in Hong Kong and third world countries alike. They really like us in Saudi Arabia, I think. Uh, so if you can, <laughs> uh, drop us a review online on Apple, on iTunes, on Spotify. You know, give us some stars. Uh, subscribe, you know, hit that subscribe button if you're on YouTube and follow us uh, every week. I'm here every Friday morning giving you the true crime news before anybody else has it. You're going to be the first to know this stuff uh, because of me. I'm bringing it to you. This is uh, Uncle James doing a public service. Thank you very much. Uh, so also remember, I'm, if you're across the pond, if you're in England, if you're in Great Britain, I will be attending the CrimeCon UK Festival in June. Check it out, CrimeCon UK. Uh, Google it. You'll find their website. Get some tickets. Come down and say hi. Uh, if you want, uh, use my code RENNER for a sweet discount on your tickets. That's RENNER, R-E-N-N-E-R. -E -N -N -E Actually, that's backwards. It's R-E-N-N-E-R. -N -N -E First up. Alex Murdaugh's trial for the murders of his wife and son began in earnest this week, and it's being called the Trial of the Century for South Carolinans, if that's how they call you. Uh, Alex's wife, Maggie, and his 22-year-old 20, son, Paul, were shot to death at the Murdaugh family's hunting lodge on June 7, 2021, sometime around 9 p.m. Now, we're learning a lot of new clues in this case uh, because of this trial we're learning all the facts um, now it, apparently alex called police around 10 p.m to report that he just found their dead bodies and said he'd been visiting his mother who had dementia when the killings actually occurred now the backstory for this trial it's very convoluted it involves several more suspicious deaths possibly at the hands of alex murdoch if you want the full and complete story, please check out the podcast, Mur The Murdaugh Murders. It's very good. The short version is that Alex Murdaugh was a lawyer in South Carolina, and he was part of a family of lawyers and judges who basically ran that part of the state for the better part of the last hundred years. In fact, a painting of his grandfather was hanging in the courtroom where the trial is taking place and they had to remove it before the jury came in. Personally, I don't like covering this case at all, and here's why. I, I know journalists are supposed to be unbiased and not care about appearance in any way. We're not supposed to write in anything about appearances in our articles. It shouldn't matter at all. But Google this guy, please, if you haven't seen him. Alex Murdoch, Google it. He's got a really creepy blank stare, like a shark's eyes, like doll's eyes, like from Jaws. And um, in every picture you can find of this guy online, he has this look on his face, like right before the picture was taken, he accidentally shit his pants. So make of that what you will, uh, but the, I'm, I'm telling you, the only way this guy ever got action was because of his family's wealth and power. Uh, and he strikes me as like an alien wearing a human suit, you know, like in Men in Black or something. 
anyways, you can stream this trial live on several news sites. You can find it online. But here are some highlights you might have missed from this week. Prosecutor Creighton Waters was able to get a witness to testify that on the day of the murders, Alex had been confronted about $792,000 that was missing in fees from his law firm, according to the Daily Mail. Now, this provides a possible motive because Maggie, Alex's wife, was also basically doing an audit of their finances at the time of her murder. The irony is that Alex was likely embezzling this money to pay for his other son's defense after a boating accident left a young woman dead. Like I said, there's lots of bodies in this case. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Jurors were also shown a Snapchat video that showed Alex shortly before the murder, wearing a bluish shirt, and then video of him right after the murders, we're talking like an hour, maybe two hours later, wearing a clean white shirt. He had changed his shirt. They were also shown a video that Alex's son, Paul, took about five minutes before the murder, where Alex says he was nowhere near the scene of the crime, but this video appears to have Alex's voice in the background. What's super interesting in this case, in this ongoing trial, is all the data that police were able to obtain from Maggie and Paul's cell phones. They were able to show, you know, this, these cell phones were pinging on towers, and they were being tracked through apps, and they were able to show that Maggie's phone was moving around after her murder. Like, they were able to show that some, like, based on steps, they could show that somebody had the phone and was walking around. And, um, you know, turning it, this, you know, into profile mode, and then up, up, upright mode. And the first responders who arrived on the scene testified that Alex did not cry, he was not crying, was not distraught about the murders. Jurors also heard audio of Alex talking to police about Paul and saying, quote, it's just so bad, I did him so bad, end quote. All this is excellent police work, but they could send it to the jury tomorrow, and I'm pretty sure Alex would be convicted because he's just so creepy. Um, that blank stare. I mean, you got you got to check it out. I, I, I can't remember of another um, high-profile case where somebody was on trial for murder like this and, and just had that, like, mannequin stare. This is one of the most evil cases I've, I've encountered. Our next story. A cardiologist in California was charged on Monday with three counts of attempted murder relating to a frightening car accident that happened on January 2nd, this according to People magazine. Last month, 42-year-old Darmish Patel was driving along Highway 1 along the California coast when his wife and their two children uh, were, in, were in, also in the car. His wife was in the passenger, passenger seat, two children in the back, 7-year-old girl, 4-year-old boy, and the car flew off the road, off a cliff, and crashed into the rocks below. Luckily, everybody survived. How? I have no idea. Every, uh, the, the people that survived, they do have lasting injuries, except for, I believe, the boy who almost a appeared unharmed. And although Patel's wife is not cooperating at the moment, she reportedly told paramedics who arrived on the scene that her husband had tried to kill them all. She's still in the hospital, and she's lawyered up and will not give further interviews. This crash occurred along a stretch of highway known as the Devil's Slide in San Mateo County. Now, drivers who witnessed this accident that were driving along the road said that they did not see any sort of brake lights on their car. The car just voom, went off the road. A video from a nearby tunnel shows the car simply driving off the edge. Now, it was a Tesla, which opens up a possible defense for him. I wonder if they're going to say that the car malfunctioned. Anyways, how frightening would that be? I still have dreams of like accidentally driving off a cliff and you have that feeling in the pit of your stomach where, you, where you're kind of weightless and waiting for the inevitable. That's a terrible way to go. Luckily, they, they, they did survive, although the wife is still in, in the hospital. 
Our final story tonight, this is a crazy story out of South Africa. Andre de Reuter is the CEO of a company called ESCOM, which produces 90% of South Africa's electricity. There have been mass blackouts around South Africa. Uh, in, in fact, they saw 188 days last year where there were power outages. This was in 2022. Now, in December, Andre submitted his resignation. He said he was done. I mean, you know, he didn't want anything to do with it anymore. And he gave them until March. He was going to continue working for the company until March, and, and, and then he was out. Now, a couple days after he submitted his resignation, he got a coffee at work, started sipping it, and then became violently ill. He was shaking, vomiting, and finally he collapsed and was rushed to the hospital where the doctors ran a bunch of tests and discovered that he'd ingested cyanide. The doctors luckily were able to save him. No word on who he thinks might have been trying to kill him. But when you're dealing with electric companies in third world countries, you're dealing with high levels of corruption. You've got bribery at the top levels. So obviously he was trying to get out of that life and somebody did not want him gone. Or if he was gone, did not want him to share any secrets once he was out. So, uh, you know, make a bookmark on that case. I think we're going to see more of it as we go along. Those are the top stories of the week, uh, but stay tuned. We've got a crazy update in the Holly Perriannon per case out of Massachusetts. We've got a couple solves by genetic genealogy. And there were two cases this week where doppelgangers tried to kill their doubles. You're not going to want to miss this. Stay tuned. I'll be back in two and two. Please hang up and try again. Hi, I'm Alexa Dow with The Porchlight Project, a new nonprofit dedicated to funding DNA testing and genetic genealogy for cold cases in the state of Ohio. For our first case, we assisted the Cuyahoga Falls Police Department funding new DNA tests on evidence from the 1987 unsolved murder of 17-year-old Barbara Blatnick. That information was given to expert genealogists who traced the genetic markers to a man named James Zastonic, who was arrested in May of 2020 and charged with Barb's murder. Our goal at the Porchlight Project is to entirely fund three to four cold case investigations every year. Each new case costs about $6,000 to complete, which is a small price to pay for closure. The Porchlight Project relies on generous donations from the public. Even $5 can help us solve a murder. For more information on how to help, please visit porchlightonline.org. And we're back with Three's Company, starring Cindy Williams. Hey, uh, here's the update in the Holly Perriannon case. Investigators this re week released new evidence. Um, and they showed this image that I'm going to show you here uh, of a tank top that was found near the crime scene. Now, remember, this, this case is kind of a big deal in Massachusetts, but, you know, many of us outside that state haven't heard about it. It's kind of wrapped up in the Molly Bish case and to some extent even the Moore Murray case. Holly was 10 years old in 1993 when her family took a vacation to Sturbridge, Massachusetts. Little Holly went for a walk to a neighbor's house to see some newborn puppies, but never made it there. Eleven weeks later, her remains were found in Brimfield, Massachusetts. Holly would have celebrated her 40th birthday on January 19th of this year. Now, this white tank top has the word Boston across the front and to me it looks like a runner's shirt right like a marathon runner's shirt somebody that does that on a daily basis police are asking for anyone who recognizes this shirt to come forward and if you know where who might have been wearing the shirt or where the shirt comes from you know maybe a 5k maybe a marathon in the area but take a look at the shirt let us know, uh, you know, if, if you know where it comes from, contact Massachusetts police. This reminds me of the Amy Mihalovic case, uh, also a 10-year-old girl, but uh, from Bay Village, Ohio, who was abducted and murdered in 1989. And then uh, FBI waited until just like four or five years ago to release 
this very important bit of evidence about a curtain that was found near her body. Now, it's a very good clue, but a lot of time has passed since then. A lot of people's memories have faded. And, and if they just would have come out with this evidence back then, maybe somebody would have recognized it. I don't know about now. We got a couple of really good solves in genetic genealogy this week. Here's a write-up from Sylvester, Georgia. <coughs> it's another solve by Othram. A woman, this is fre fresh off the wires, as they say, a woman who remained unidentified for 37 years has been identified as Mary Agna Cowan, missing out of Seminole County, Florida. Now, on Friday, May 14, 1985, the Baker County Sheriff's Office requested the Georgia Bureau of Identification to assist them with an investigation to the discovery of a woman who had been found injured and unconscious on the west side of the Georgia Highway 91, north of Newton. The woman was taken to a hospital where she died of her injuries on June 1, 1985. Officers found the manner of death was undetermined and the cause of death was subdural hematoma. She'd been beaten. On, a, on September 21st, 2012, the woman was exhumed and a sample of bone was obtained. The bone fragment was sent to a private company. On March 2022, uh, the GBI in Georgia partnered with the Federal Bureau of Investigation to have genetic genealogy done. A portion of her remains was submitted to our friends at Othram, a private DNA lab in Texas. And in October, just a few months later, a DNA profile was generated, turned over to the FBI. The research yielded a high probability the, the unidentified woman was one Mary Agna Cowan, a.k.a. Angie. Agents obtained DNA from one of Cohen's children, and the comparison indicated, in fact, that was a parent-child relationship. So the investigation into her murder continues, but now she has a name. Second story for genetic genealogy. Also, an author solve on June 15, 1986, a human skull was found on the banks of the Delaware River in Bucks County, PA. Now, last year, police sent the skull to Othram Labs for, for testing, and this week, they announced that the skull belongs to Richard Thomas Alt, last seen alive on Christmas Eve 1984. Alt's girlfriend's body was discovered in April of that year in New Jersey, according to phillyblurbs.com, and the family suspected all this time that he'd been murdered as well, and they did have their suspicions confirmed, and... Now they can have some modicum of closure in that case. And again, the investigation of the murder continues. Uh, this week I have a double feature in, world, uh, in weird news. And this is all about doppelgangers. In New York this week, a Brooklyn woman went on, woman went on trial for giving her friend a piece of cheesecake laced with a deadly poison, according to People.com. Why did she poison her friend with some cheesecake? I mean, how terrible is that? Now this, this woman's not going to be able to eat cheesecake for the rest of her life. That's terrible. Be well, anyways, it, the, the issue was the two women, they looked a lot alike. And 47-year-old Victoria Nasarova wanted to steal her friend's identity so that she could not be deported to Russia. The victim was Olga Trisk, who had come from Ukraine. Now, prosecutor, prosecutor showed how Victoria had texted Olga that she had had an eyelash emergency. Olga was, um, she, she did makeup and eyelashes and things like that. I don't know what contact, uh, what, what, um, uh, <laughs> I don't know what an eyelash emergency really is or, or what that could, um, could be, but uh, apparently it's a thing. So anyway, she texted Olga that she had this eyelash emergency and said that she was bringing over a piece of cheesecake as a thank you. The cheesecake, police later found, was laced with phenazepam, 
a Russian-made tranquilizer, or as I like to call it, <laughs> a Tuesday night. Um, luckily, Olga survived to tell the tale. When she didn't die, Victoria stole $4,000 in cash in Olga's passport and tried to vamos, vamonos, vamoose. Staged, uh, and uh, Victoria also staged Olga's bedroom to look like a suicide. Prosecutors discovered that Victoria is wanted for murder in Russia for the 2014 death of a 54-year-old woman who died after Victoria swindled her out of some money. So uh, if you're wanted for murder in Russia, you certainly don't want to go back, but uh, it looks like that's where Victoria's headed pretty soon. But there's more. There's, you know, how weird is that? You know, somebody killing, attempting to kill a friend because they looked alike and wanted to disappear. But that wasn't the only story like that this week. There's a very similar case out of Germany. This brought to you by The Guardian. Prosecutors allege that 23-year-old German, uh, a, a German-Iraqi woman, uh, sought out a look-alike. She was looking for somebody that looked like her on Instagram. And she wanted to murder this person so she could fake her own death and assume the woman's ID. This investigation started with the discovery of a body last August in a park Mercedes in southern Germany. Police initially ID'd that dead body as that of Sherban K., a 23-year-old uh, beautician. Now, Sherban's family ID'd the body, said, yeah, that's her. But then an autopsy raised some questions, and the coroner realized, oh, I don't think this is really Sherban. The victim was eventually ID'd as one Khadija O., a blogger from Algeria, who just happened to look a lot like Sherban. Prosecutors did some investigating, detectives did some investigating, and they now believe that Sherban killed her to assume her identity so she could run away from a family dispute. Some weird stuff was going on in the family. She wanted to disappear. And one of the reasons they believe this is that police, I think, uh, it apparently um, got some sort of subpoena for her cell records and her social media records, and they found that several women, women who looked like Sherban, who looked like Khadija, had been contacted to meet with Khadija slight, right, right before the murder, um, shortly before the murder. So it appears that she was kind of shopping around to see who would take the bait. She just wanted to assume their identity and disappear. Strange, strange cases. In pop culture this week, the new documentary you should all be watching is Murph the Surf. It's a new tri true crime documentary out of MGM+. Plus. And this details the life of Jack Roland Murphy, who was a surfer from Oceanside, California. Back in 1964, he was part of a team that stole 24 precious gems, including the Star of India, from the American Museum of Natural History in Manhattan. Now, they, in the days leading up to that that heist, they, they were casing the place, and they noticed that this museum was keeping its windows open in the summer for ventilation, just a couple inches. And they also noticed that the security alarms were not working. So it was pretty easy for them to come back in the night, open the windows, sneak inside, and steal these gems from the Museum of Natural History. Can you imagine that? So much has changed in the last 60 years. These gems were worth $400,000. Now, two days later, after the heist, police uh, were tipped off that three men were at a nearby hotel racking up a crazy uh, bill and throwing lavish parties. And they kind of connected the two events and realized that that was their, those were their robbers. Now, uh, Murph the Surf was also charged with the assault of actress Ava Gabor. They did recover most of the jewels, although some remain um, unfound. And uh, Murph was eventually charged with murder. So heists, murder, 60s, I I'm in. I'm sold. You don't need to tell me anymore. Um, I'm going to check it out. Also, you heard it here first. 
There is a new true crime documentary premiering at the South by Southwest Film Festival in early March. They just released the lineup of this film festival. And included in the documentary section is a little film called Citizen Sleuth. And if you're very much into true crime, I suggest you look it up because it's going to be fabulous. Uh, a, a friend of mine is producing the, the film, and I guarantee you know some of the principles involved. It will give a new slant on um, social media, um, you know, armchair sleuths and podcasters. And you're going to see some people in a very different light. I, I can't wait for it. So check it out. Uh, let me grab a book from the bookshelf to tell you about. I'm always getting these true crime books. Uh, this week, I want to tell you about this book about some very famous cases out of the UK. This book is called The Moors Murderers, The Full Story of Ian Brady and Myra Hindley by C.G.C. Cook. It's got a great cover, nice thick book, goes into detail here, maybe a little too much detail. Here's the write-up. Meticulously researched, The Moore's Murders gives readers a rare and fascinating look into the lives of Ian Brady and Maya Hindley. Now, if you're not from across the pond, if you're not from England, you might not know this case. Let me, let me learn you a little bit. Now, Ian and Myra were often referred to as the most evil couple in British history. After a torture and killing spree that lasted two years and left five innocent children dead, Many aspects of their lives have been kept hidden from the public. Cook's new release changes that, making unseen photographs, letters, and accounts public for the first time. The couple's vile torture and killings have shaken up British history, with the couple often considered two of the most evil people to have lived. However, the public still may have many questions about who they were and how this dysfunctional relationship operated. This book answers many of those questions. Um, Trigger warning, read it if you dare, buyer beware, the Moors murderers. And that's the, that's the news for this week. Kind of a crazy week. Um, in some ways, a quiet week. Nothing too huge, but some trials going on. We have updates and cold cases. Things are progressing and moving forward. 2023 looks pretty good so far. And it is the weekend. You know, we've survived another week. And in the words of the incomparable Murray Saul, that means we have to celebrate, and in fact, it's time we got to, got to, gotta, 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 got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, gotta, 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 get down, damn it. True Crime This Week is a fearful symmetry production. Photo and artwork are licensed through Shutterstock. If you like the cut of my jib, I have another podcast you might enjoy called The Philosophy of Crime in which I attempt to solve the big questions behind our true crime obsession by looking to philosophy for answers. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next week. Sit, Brownie, sit. Good dog.